do you think that it's a practical alternative to taking patients? Hello, everybody. Well, I hope you uh, found the last couple of hours uh, illuminating. I certainly, I certainly did, and uh, uh, we have made a number of commitments which we will f follow through. I uh, would like to now start the formal board meeting, but of course, what we've just sat through for the last couple of hours is uh, a formal board meeting, part of the formal board meeting. So everything that uh, was said was 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 recorded in all of those um, slides will be available on our website uh, in due course. Uh, I don't know how long it takes Lisa to get them up there. After the board meeting today. So all the slides uh, will be up there. So hopefully that will be something you can all look at. Good. So welcome and apologies to absence. We have um, apologies from Peter Davies, Trevor Fitzgerald, and James Marsh, Mar Marsh and Dr. Chris Elliott. Um, are there any new declarations of interest? Thank you. Can we go through the minutes of the previous board meeting, which are on my iPad, I haven't got them here. But can we just quickly yeah. scroll through them? Thanks. So we've got eight pages, which I shall... OK, so anyone got any comments on page one? Page two, page three, page four, page five, page six, or seven or eight. In which case, thank you very much. Uh, we'll take those. Uh, next item is Chairman's update. Well, uh, you will <laughs> all of. Uh, I, I think you're all in the meeting just now, and you will know uh, what we are talking about. As I said at the meeting, the discussion at that meeting was was uh, very illuminating for us, very valuable for us. We made some commitments which we will continue to, which we will obviously keep to, and uh, we would hopefully invite you all to continue to attend our board meetings so we can keep you updated. Um, but. In the interest of time, we're not going to take any more questions or do any more discussion on that topic. So that's really. Oh, sorry, Morris. I didn't realise that. Um, it was a it was a, a whole a uh, couple of hours um, devoted to possible land sales here at Epsom Hospital in order to fund a lot of much needed improvements at Epsom Hospital. It was an Epsom issue, yeah. Okay. So, can I just ask what, because we didn't all manage to get our questions asked, can we now email them through? Yes. Yes, email them into Lisa. Um, I, email them to me, I'll quite happily give you my well, just email me. Or email You've got my email address. Okay, that's fine, thank you. I'm not going to go Yeah, good. Thank you. So, that's my chairman's update, really. Um, Daniel. Um, okay, so going from land sale to running of Epsom and St. Helier in the here and now. Uh, so the chief exec's report. So it begins talking about A&E. So the extreme heat uh, has meant that A&E has been more busy this summer than it's ever really been. Uh, and we're at record levels of uh, um, attendances. Um, I think we should be really proud, though, of our staff, because in the month of June and in the month of July, we delivered the standard for A&E. Uh, and we were one of very few trusts that actually managed to do that in the context of um, the very high temperatures. Uh, the other consequence of the very high temperatures is a whole heap of um, uh, infrastructure failures that related from it, which we, we, we dealt with in the, big, the other meeting, so I won't go into that part of the, um, uh, the report. But other than a really big thank you for all the staff who worked so hard to mean the environment didn't compromise patient care. Um, the, uh, there's a bit in here about junior doctors. So we just came to the end of the rotations of all the junior doctors, and they uh, decided to give each other awards to celebrate uh, their colleagues. And then they decided to dis give some awards to the consultants who had, both, who had given them the best training. Uh, and um, so that was really very uh, a wonderful thing to be uh, part of. Um, we uh, launched a, uh, a new uh, set of awards called Epsom and Hellier Heroes. Uh, so that's where members of staff can 
nominate other members of staff who have gone and done something extraordinary, either to support a member of staff or for a patient that has been witnessed. And we, uh, we've begun giving out the uh, awards for Epsom and Heller Heroes. We try to have one every week, which isn't very hard because the number of nominations I'm getting is huge. Uh, and the, the one featured here is about uh, one of our paediatricians, Dr. Mar, and the diabetes nurse specialist, who provided the most outstanding support for our uh, a young couple whose kid uh, got diagnosed at a very young age with diabetes and what they had, had uh, done. Um, the, uh, um, uh, then there was, um, we also gave an Epsom Sally Hero Award to Oriel Primary School uh, because they decided to raise money for the children's uh, unit. Uh, and we went and presented them with uh, the Hero uh, Award and lots of badges for the children. Um, the uh, um, we had great fun celebrating the NHS's 70th birthday, as you can see. Um, and then, really, really importantly, we want to begin properly to understand what do 5,000 people who work in Epsom and Helia actually think about Epsom and Helia. Uh, and um, the, uh, we launched this program called Your Voice, Your Values. Uh, and we're hoping that in September, we get the opportunity to talk to about 3,000 of our staff for two hours at a time. Uh, about everything, about what motivates them to come to work and the things we need to do to make coming to work better. Uh, and I'm very hopeful that that happens uh, and we get lots of people coming. Um, I've just noticed that um, one of the people who got an Epsom and Helio Heroes Award is actually sitting in the audience. So Carol did some extraordinary things uh, in one of the infrastructure issues. So uh, I hope you're wearing your Epsom and Helio Hero badge. No. <laughs> um, the... Uh, and then um, lastly, in terms of um, new things opening, we've opened a brand new diabetes centre at St Helia. Um, and uh, having been a bit sceptical, the diabetes team, that, that their move was going to be of benefit, I, now, I think they now think the space they're occupying is way better than they ever had before and are very happy. So well done the States, and uh, I'm sure Terry had a hand in making that happen. Um, and then e-referrals, so we're... Uh, the, 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 the NHS decided that we're not uh, GPs aren't allowed to send referrals by paper anymore, uh, and it's been an absolutely superhuman effort to get our IT systems to cope with doing everything electronically. But we've gone from having some of the lowest rates of uh, electronic referrals to now one of the highest rates of electronic referrals in not very many weeks. The highest at the point at which you switch off. Uh, so that's a great uh, tribute to everybody, um, and. Also, we've got a superb new uh, head of nursing for infection control called Prodeen, and we featured her in my weekly message. And I think that's probably enough. Thank you. Can I just, uh, just ask on the your voice, your values? Uh, you start Daniel, Lisa, how have you got to get your values um, We are um, holding two specialist um, uh, um, events specifically for patients. Um, we have written out to all of the patient groups and would you believe now I've got 380 on my distribution list of different patient groups um, uh, to invite local people who've had probably within the last five years um, an experience either as a patient or as a relative of a patient to come and join us on one of the, um, those two events. In addition to that we've sent um, out surveys and there are surveys available on Online, so that patients can actually give us their feedback and funny enough today um, a couple of people have handed those surveys mm. into me so we're doing them both in paper format um, and online so if people can't make the events um, they still have an opportunity to input into helping us shape our future. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Now I'm going to change the order because I know that Dr. Stockdale has to leave at uh, 11 45, so I'd like to go on to item Okay, so this is uh, my regular annual uh, report to the board as responsible officer, um, which is the function by which we assure ourselves and the public that our doctors are fit to practice. Um, the, um, I'm conscious of time, so the, the, the report has been circulated. The points that I would 
pick out of it are that from the point of view of doctors about whom one might have concerns, uh, we have roughly similar numbers to, to um, other organisations of the same size and our attempts are always supportive to try and, and um, make sure that doctors are actually able to deliver what they want to uh, and desire to deliver, which is a high quality service. Um, in terms of medical appraisal, we received the um, annual comparator report, which I did circulate late, um, but um, has been circulated. And it does show, unfortunately, that our uh, rates of appraisal have fallen slightly behind those of other organisations. They're still up well over 80% within the uh, expected time limit. Uh, but uh, for some groups who have almost entirely clinical jobs, they're not as high as they should be. Part of that is as a result of the partial implementation rather than the full implementation so far of last year's recommendation that there should be additional administrative support. The supporting person was appointed, but their job has changed somewhat with other priorities in medical staffing. Um, the, um, so that the uh, re recommendations are as shown in the report, uh, and one particular issue is the fact that, in fact, I am retiring at the end of October, and the Trust will therefore need to decide how it manages that, and there are three options for replacement uh, there. Um, in in the uh, in the paper, um, and finally there is the annual assurance uh, framework paper, which the board needs to sign off uh, to return to NHS England, which is also presented. So I'm happy to take any questions uh, that people may have. Well, I mean, we've been extremely happy. We didn't ha have a meeting to which this could come first, but um, on previous occasions we've we've looked at it um, very closely, and, and Martin has always been very responsive, and I would like to thank him very much for fulfilling this role. I'm horrified that he's not going to be with us. And I do, I would hope that there can at least be some overlap between a new, new appointee and Martin um, extending his role, because it is absolutely key to the safety of medical practice in the Trust. Yes, I think that would be my preferred option of the three, that there is an overlapping period. Good, thank you very much. Any other points on the report? In which case, Martin, thank you very much. Thank you very much on behalf of the board for your role as uh, responsible officer. And uh, good luck in your retirement. Thank, Thank you. you. I suspect I shall be. I'm sure you. Will. I'm sure you will. Just like so many. <laughs> I mean, I don't mean that in any form of disparagement whatsoever, because we very much appreciate the fact that people who retire from the NHS continue to work in the NHS, and it's actually really important and vital that uh, that that they do. Thank you very much, Martin. Right. We'll now go back to item two, uh, two one. So the integrated performance and risk report. Okay, thank you very much. I'll start. Um, so the thing I'd like to highlight from page one one um, is that whilst um, in year our HSMR remains within um, the sort of below expected range, we did have a higher than expected number of patient deaths during the month of March, which is within the bounds of normal statistical variation. However, as we always do when um, we see such data, we are undertaking, undertaking a deep dive into that patient group. Um, and early indications are that there is no particular theme that's emerged. Um, and I also can give <coughs> assurance that whilst we don't yet have our HSMR data for April and May, we know looking at the raw numbers that the trend has gone back to where it has sat um, over the course of the last um, few months and indeed years. Um, our mortality review process continues and I'm happy to report that we've um, 
been given some additional funding so that we can have more medical staff undertaking mortality reviews on a real-time basis. And I think that will really strengthen our risk and governance processes. If I come on to um, page one, two, um, I think to pick up the issue around stroke, where in month, you'll see this is May, um, on neither site did the requisite um, number of patients spend the majority of their stay on a stroke unit. This does reflect operational pressures, which were still in play in the month of May. Um, I think on the Epsom site, it's important to note that some uh, sort of reconfiguration of the ward areas um, and the stroke service moving into Epsom Health and Care will actually help address that figure. But how we're capturing where patients are staying under the new system is not yet reflected in the IPR. In terms of the um, referral of TIA patients, um, I think the first point to make, this is making sure that patients who are at risk of, of having had um, what's called a transient ischemic attack and who could go on to have a stroke, it's making sure they're seen very swiftly. Um, and we've talked before about the challenges in working with primary care to make sure those patients are referred in in a very timely way. We're talking here about very small numbers. We're literally talking three or four patients per month. So it's difficult to draw statistical conclusions. However, what I can say is two different things have happened since then. Um, firstly, this links into the electronic referral system. So the electronic referral system now makes explicitly clear the clinic in which those patients should be seen and allows the GP to book them directly in. And I think that will be a huge um, benefit for patients moving forward. Um, and then to um, supplement that, uh, Panita, our stroke lead, has also done a communications which we've agreed with the CCG um, and through our clinical quality reference group to send out to GPs, um, pushing the importance of patients being referred in, in in such a swift way. So we are hoping to see an increase in the figures, but I do urge a note of caution given the small numbers that this data set um, pertains to. Um, in terms of VTE, um, we were frustratingly below the 95% in month. Um, there is a huge amount going on in terms of us doing deep dives and looking both at the methodology and the areas where there is um, the least good compliance. The areas that we're focusing on now, interestingly, are not medicine, it's actually surgery. Compliance in medicine, we think, with the whiteboards has gone up very significantly. We're now seeing surgery uh, be an area that is not complying as highly as they should be. And we believe that may be because some clinicians think patients are exempt from having the um, assessment done because there is not a uniform uh, set of national exemptions. So when our staff rotate in, um, we're seeing them assume that we uh, don't need to undertake assessments for patients, that in our trust must have an assessment. So we're using performance meetings and the new doctor's induction to um, address that issue. Ruth, can I just ask, does that suggest that our standards are higher than they are elsewhere? Um, potentially, because there isn't a, there isn't a national, um, nationally agreed set of standards. So I think the easiest thing is actually to say that it, it's all patients. Um, and, and that is the point that we're reinforcing. But it seems that um, elsewhere, um, uh, sort of various exemptions have been agreed. Um, and that makes it very difficult when staff are moving posts. Um, so we're reverting back to everybody. Um, um, and then just to highlight on page one three, um, the uh, ongoing challenges in completing our incident reports. Um, what has happened since June um, is that, um, as I alluded to, we've had some agreement around investment in medical time to help with the clinical aspect of our root cause analysis as well as mortality reviews. Um, and we have also um, restructured um, the uh, quality resource within medicine and have actually put the Trust's most senior quality manager into the medicine team with some extra administration resource to actually manage this. And I will later on be talking um, in the private part of the board about the, the progress we've seen in, in SI submission. But I note that as, as an area of ongoing concern alongside the compliance shown in month with duty of candle, yes, which historically I, has been very high. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. What does the 50% of what? Okay, so it's where there is evidence. So if there is... Um, a patient safety incident that results in moderate or severe harm, 
then we should be able to readily demonstrate written communication with the family that shows we've applied the duty of candour. Um, so the 50% means that in looking at 50, only in looking at 50% of cases is there a readily auditable data trail on our DATIC system. It doesn't mean the duty of candour hasn't been enacted, but it means it isn't documented on the system where it needs to be. And so um, it's important to note duty of candour training is now part of our all staff induction. Um, and this is, again is being addressed within the divisional teams because we historically have actually had an exceptionally high rate of compliance with this metric. Um, and clearly we need to be in a position where, being, where we are being honest and open in a timely way with families. Um, and then I'll hand over to Arlene Just for before one you do that, Ruth, mm. Going back to the um, VTE yep. and the um, you know, the standards that we're setting, yeah. are there any other areas where we see or understand and believe our standards are different um, to those that might be adopted elsewhere, which feed back mm. into any of our KPIs? Um, so the other standard where we've been having similar discussions is around readmission rates. Um, where there was also um, the potential to apply different exclusions. Um, so those are the two areas within my own um, and James's portfolio we, where we've identified these when you start to do a deep dive into the issues that are um, driving suboptimal performance. And also, Ruth, this ties in with a comment that our auditors, KPMG, made when they were auditing the quality account when they looked at our VTE assessments and they found that um, we were under-reporting our compliance by quite a considerable margin in their view. So um, I'm very pleased that we are doing some analysis of what what we should be doing here. Yeah. We're, we're actually, to, to show you the importance we're placing on this, um, we're looking at every single patient who did not have an assessment in May. Um, and literally going through every single set of notes to, to, so we really understand the, the, the reason why the assessment was not recorded, which may mean it was done, but not recorded. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Just following up on that point, sorry. Um, one of the benefits that we thought would come from the electronic whiteboards was the visibility yep. of these metrics. Um, we're now quite a long way, they're well embedded in their use. Are we seeing that benefit? Yes, we are in medicine. So I think what we've seen is a year ago, the, it was the medical wards where VTE compliance was poorer. Now we're seeing that largely VTE compliance in the medicine wards is much better, which I think does link in to the huddles and the whiteboard. And we've seen the position flip so that surgical areas and day case areas are now the area that are the areas rather that aren't delivering as they should be. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So uh, on one four, the only thing to highlight is that in terms of um, the falls with harm have gone up slightly in, in the month, uh, although our overall falls rate remains within the Royal College of Physicians um, targets. So, ceiling. On 1.5, um, safe staffing. So our care hours per patient day um, remains above the national average, which I think there has been a lot of discussion around the fact that on the, on the wards, staff on the, wall, on the wards feel like this, the wards are understaffed or there aren't enough staff. And uh, um, I've started to do a uh, and a review of the establishment, uh, so <coughs> what we have actually said we should have and looking at whether we, we that's enough um, and looking at what we actually have. Some of the staffing issues are compounded by um, sickness, absence and how we allocate leave. So that's work that is un ongoing, but in terms of what we are reporting on um, the model hospital, we are within um, and in some cases, it's better than our, the national average and that of our pairs. Uh, we have chosen to use the supervisory status of our ward managers um, 
to as an indication of how well the wards are staffed or are, are supported. Um, and in in June, we we only achieved that 58% of the time in St. Helier uh, and in Epsom, 48%. And what that means is that the ward managers, instead of being able to just coordinate or be out of the numbers, they're actually taking patients because mm -hmm. to support the staff on the wards. We are continuing to recruit, and in June we had 31 RNs start with the trust. Um, uh, well, 31 new appointments, although 11 of those were just exter internal moves. Uh, we also had 10 uh, healthcare support workers. So uh, recruitment is continuing. On 1-5, um, a better story than last month in terms of uh, C. diff, and we have um, managed to stay within our monthly trajectory for C, for C. diff, and, and we've had no hospital-acquired MRSA bacteremias. Our hand hygiene, um, we are still doing some work around that, but that is improving in terms of compliance. And um, as we said, Prodine, our new infection control lead nurse, has started, um, and she's doing a lot of work around reviewing how we do these audits and what needs to happen, including changing some of the products that we use and our infection prevention training as well. She's working on how we can improve that. Sorry. Can I just ask about um, staffing? Yes. Um, you know, in the previous meeting, there were various comments made that, yes. you know, the place felt understaffed and so on. I mean, uh, what are the actual statistics? What, how many more people do we have, if you like, this month than we had three months ago, for example? I haven't looked at that, so I wouldn't be able to tell. I think part of the <coughs> people. Yeah. Yeah. people. Yeah. Yeah. From July 2017, we had 3,282 clinical staff, and as at June 18, we have 3,475. So we are on an upward trajectory at recruiting people. Overall. Yeah. But our demand for people goes up as we take on more services. So part of it is that. Um, and our establishments have increased as well as we've tried to invest in more people to be yeah. safer. So we've still got uh, at least 300 clinical staffing posts not filled, yeah. which is a lot less than we started with, proportionately. But it's still, that's what people experience on the ground. On the ground. Yeah. And so on the ground, that's why it sort of sometimes feels stressed. Yes, yeah. yes. I, um, I have to say... And, we, and, and can you say anything more about nurse recruitment, particularly nurse and healthcare assistant recruitment? Because I know that, uh, as we said in the other meeting, we used to get a lot of people from Europe, we don't anymore. They just altered the guidelines in terms of uh, visa requirements and so on from other countries. Where are we at on all of that? So I think we, we are reviewing around the discussion with um, Carol yesterday, I think, as well, um, and NHSI about what else we can do. So we continue to recruit anyway. I think the, the, the question now is about where else can we go, and I think we had um, a slight discussion about that the last time in terms of ponds to fish in. And interestingly, on the way here, one of the consultants met me and said, you know, one of the nurses on the ward had suggested um, that we go to Guyana, um, which is in the Caribbean. I do know that the only country in the Caribbean that you can register with the NMC straight away is Trinidad. So if we do go to the Caribbean, it might have to be that. But we are looking at kind of overseas recruitment in that way. We're also looking at how we use the newly developed posts to support care. And Dan and I had a discussion yesterday um, around using non-clinical staff to support this, the clinical staff on the ward. So that is, is roles like discharge coordinators, because a lot of the times that registered nurses are spending sorting out discharges, they could be doing clinical care that only they can do. Um, and then you can have non, a non-clinical person that supports the discharge. So they, they, you know, they contact nursing homes, speak to the GP or doctors to do the TTO. <coughs> so we're looking at introducing those kinds of roles. We have introduced a couple of roles. Um, uh, look, I, I've 
they're called just support uh, for the wards, and those those individuals again <clears throat> are not clinical, but they support our patients like the, with dementia patients um, who who they can just sit with or do activities with because those are the patients that can take quite a lot of time uh, settling and supporting. So we are looking at, at different roles as well. Thank you. So that, that is that as well. That one of the things that we will be working on with the new HR director in a few weeks is attrition and understanding why we would be doing a little bit better than we do and respond to it. Because obviously, in a sense, that's always the root cause. Yeah. Um, Arlene, could I could I ask a question? I was just looking at the um, at the red flags, and they all seem to be focused on B six. What's going on there? Why is B six an issue? I I I think there are red flags everywhere. Um, B6 is particularly challenged with that. We are looking at how we support them differently. I think it's, it's just about how we identify where the issues are, which <clears throat> sometimes this report gives an overall picture of what we need to, to focus in. And I think it, it has come up around B6, but I think there are other areas that might be more challenged, even though B6 has the, has the red flag. And, that red flag, the only one that we look at is shifts with one registered nurse, but there are other indicators, and we're looking at how we can get those to triangulate and identify where the real issues are. <coughs> so, do you want to do maternity quickly? Yeah. So, yeah, maternity, uh, well, Maternity looks quite green for June, so um, we are doing um, well, and, and you know that, that that's despite lift breakdowns and things like that, which does hinder them sometimes. Yes, I mean I know the lift breakdowns meant a problem between the labour ward and the that's it. Centre. Yes, yeah. And yeah. Also, I understand it because of the heat; it was incredibly hot. Yes, it was. was yes, ward. yeah. And I don't know how they cope. Well, they did fans, they did fans and ice lollies for patients and flat, cool flannels and, you know, everything else that's physically possible. So Dim lights, closed windows. We've, we've both walked around. Yeah. It's, it's not great. And the air inlet pipe, because you can't even move the air, is taken off the bitumen roof, which is at 47 degrees centigrade. So you can't even move the air with the cooling system, because yeah. what you're doing is sucking sub-oven sub temperatures down off the roof and spraying it around the ward. So there aren't any rapid, quick solutions no. beyond the ones that Arlene and I have discussed with yeah. the estates teams. It's not a fast solution. No. Mm. Well, hopefully the weather will stay. Yes. Yeah. I mean, one of the other issues that we have that's probably not in this report is around the fact that with the, the rising temperatures, we need to monitor our drugs. So the, the, the temperatures in clinical rooms, and we have worked... Um, with pharmacy, you for Carol in my absence, to develop an SOP around that, which we'll be strengthening so that we, sh we have a really good process for um, rotating our drugs. Good. Thanks very much, Molly. Let's move on <coughs> to uh, Dan, please. Shall I just do patient experience oh, for yes, you, Dan, sorry. first? Sorry, no, it's only, it's, it's quite quick. Different. I oh, know. Um, on patient experience, yeah. I'd like to highlight two things on the friends and family test. Firstly, uh, the maternity. Um, the board will remember um, um, we had last year some struggling to get maternity data in and getting the response rate. We now have very, very strong strong response rates in maternity and um, strong recommender scores as well so that gives you a better picture in terms of what's going on in maternity and that's really great to see um, and also a quick mention for a and &E, um, in terms of both the response rate and the recommender score being green so we're now green across the whole of the board and that's really positive um, um, movement particularly in a and &E, considering the pressures in there um, and what the guys have had to deal with um, it, during this heat so our patients are still reporting back um, they're having um, a strong experience in A&E so I think that's important to report back 
Um, in terms of uh, PALS, PALS continues to be incredibly busy, um, but the guys are managing really, really well. Um, and again, we are seeing strong uh, requests for information, um, not just about general inquiries, but about clinical care as well. Um, and they continue to meet the target that we've set them in terms of answering queries within either 24 or 48 hours, depending what that query is. So they, they're very good, strong. Um, performance there um, and complaints uh, we are starting to see the fruits of our labor in terms of re um, designing the service um, and recruiting to full-time posts so now we're able to say we have no agency um, working within uh, the complaints team they are substantive posts thanks to Rakesh and the team for all the support with that um, we made we made that move um, so it's costing us less but you can see the um, benefits in terms of the performance um, and it's not just that we are getting the letters out on time it also means if you have a look at which I think is a really important um, uh, rate to look at is how many of those complainants come back and say you haven't answered the question we term those reopened um, and our reopened rate remains extremely stable and is probably the lowest it has ever been since we started recording that data thank you chairman Um, I'll just quickly go through the three components of performance. So cancer is, as you'll remember, reported a month in arrears. Um, we've achieved the cancer standard for May, and we've now established that we've also achieved it for June and for the quarter as a whole, which is bucking a local trend. So that's really impressive achievement by the teams. There's still challenges in a couple of the areas with um, relationships between how we move patients through to other hospitals, but we're overcoming most of those as well. So at the moment, I'm reasonably confident about our cancer performance. Um, if we move on to elective care, the two critical graphs are the ones on the right-hand side of the paper. The first is the overall size of the waiting list, and the second is the size of the backlog. And you'll recall that the national challenge is to reduce those so that the overall size of the waiting list and the backlog are no higher than they were at the beginning of this financial year. And you can see there the progress that we are making thus far towards the end of June. Um, I think progress is being made, but it's still fragile. We know we've got some recruiting challenges, and I think July and August present us some challenges, but I'm confident that over the longer term, so the next six to nine months, we'll be able to continue that downward trajectory. So, um, will, the, uh, will the ERS improve it? Um, we're finding in the early days of ERS that it is increasing our DNA rate very slightly, so there are some complications around that. So whilst the patients may commit to going to some places, we have found that with one of our CCGs as part of their GP education programme, not all of them were printing off and giving the patients an appointment letter, and therefore they were walking away with a date in their head, but not then turning up. So there are some complications around that, but you can see from our activity that we are seeing and seeing more patients in outpatients and more people in theatres. So there is a dem demonstrable progress being made on all the key indicators through elective activity. I think it's really key, isn't it, to, to realise, for everyone to realise, that the old days of going to your GP and then saying, oh, well, make a referral, and a few days or a few weeks later, later you get a letter through the post to say, come to this hospital, and probably on a day you can't do. Uh, those days are pretty well over now, and the GPs will talk to you about your availability and hand you essentially an appointment on the spot. So that's a really great improvement when it works. If I may just add, um, we, we discussed the RTT performance and we had a fa really fantastic paper from Dan on RTT performance. I think it's fragile, but we know where the hotspots are and we are actively addressing them. And I think that, you know, we were a long way from where we were even six months ago, I think. Thank you. Um, in terms of diagnostics, um, our successes in cancer and RTT are, we believe, driving some fragility into diagnostics. And I'd say the greatest area of fragility is probably MRI. Um, just as an illustration, it takes... too much pressure. No, it, it, it's a sign of success. We've seen our prostate referrals rising because of the new pathways you've introduced. Yeah. They ask you to do an MRI earlier as part of that automatic process. An MRI for a prostate takes about 45 minutes. You can do an MRI on a limb or a joint in about 20 minutes. So this increase is eating up 
diagnostic time and that's driving in some fragility. We're doing a full capacity map at the moment, but I think the performance around this particular measure will be fragile for the next two to three months, even though I know we've achieved it in June. Um, last minute cancellations have dropped. Um, we're now down to one against the 28 day standard and some of the work we're doing about theatre capacity should, I hope, improve that so we get a bit more consistent delivery. And as you can see there, our referrals continue to be a success. At the point at which we switched off paper measures, we were receiving 74% of referrals electronically in the week up to paper switch off at the beginning of August. And so paper is now gone? Paper is gone. There are a couple of very small exemptions for patients who are on a two-week pathway who cannot prove mm. that they have NHS numbers and the whole system hinges on an NHS number. Mm. So we're trying to work out a solution for that so you can prove entitlement Sorry, yeah, to treatment. Sorry, the public, where do you find your NHS number? We, want mine. Um, we can normally find it by using your national insurance number and oh. then going in through that way or if you've previously yeah. been a patient it will be on the system. Right. Could, um, I had to ask the same question myself. So, um, Could I ask you a question please, Dan? You, you mentioned last minute cancelled operations. Um, are these due to theatre capacity or other pressures throughout the hospital um, because we just don't have beds available for people in these circumstances? So there's a, there's a high degree of seasonality tied to it and I think, I mean I could bring it back to board and we've definitely discussed it at Park and we did so last month, you can see huge seasonal variation where the bed capacity drives that. We're doing some work at the moment to try and expand our day case capacity in Epsom to give us some relief against those sorts of things. But sometimes you are talking about treating people who are sick, who are sick on the day in an unexpected manner. So the fact that we've only had one breach against the 28-day standard, I think there will always be a low level of you can't legislate for people's fitness on the day. What we're trying to do is reduce the overall number of late notice by which we use as a local measure 72 hours before your time of operation and trying to eliminate all of the delays there to make sure that what we put on the list goes ahead more consistently. I think we should add in an, actually an extra chart of the number of procedures we've actually done mm -hmm. because we're now at a record amount of activity. So we are trying to get more and more patients through the capacity by being more and more efficient yeah. and the consequence of that sometimes is we don't quite get the scheduling or the all sorts of other things that you don't have to get right to get the operation to happen spot on. So I think we should add in actual yeah, activity yeah. levels so you can see we are treating more people. I think that, we can I think that, that would well. be immensely helpful actually to see that because that ties in with the comment about increasing the usage in our theatres yes. as well. And the work we're doing at the moment, there's a theatre review ongoing at the moment to work out how we can absolutely confirm that we're using every minute of our theatre time in a justifiable fashion so there's not a wasted minute going on and that should drive it but as Daniel's alluded to that does bring you up against some physical realities at the moment about our bed stock. Um, in terms of emergency performance um, in June we achieved the 95% um, standard um, we didn't, unfortunately, make the quarter, but we are above our year trajectory, which is 93.7. Um, July, we have also achieved, as Daniel said, and the last week's been particularly impressive. So at the moment, we seem to be embedding some of the gains that we've made, and there's a whole series of programmes underway to try and reduce our fragility over the Christmas period or the Am winter I period. I'm thinking that what we've got to do this year is beat what we did last year. For quarters one and two, we need to achieve 95 or above. For quarter, um, unfortunately, each rather than in aggregate. For quarter three, we need to achieve better than we did last year, and I can't remember that number, but I think it's about 91%. And then quarter four is defined by the month of March, which is 95%. That's the standard we've been set. So this is quite complicated, and you need to know that we have not got the bonus funding for quarter one for A&E because we didn't deliver 95% for the quarter. So, how much is that? Seven hundred thousand pounds. What I'm hoping, with my fingers crossed, that if we deliver quarter two, and we get to be over ninety-five percent by the end of quarter two, that we might be able to have a negotiation for them to pay us quarter one, as well as quarter two at quarter two. But that would be optimistic. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably it's probably worth noting that the Epsom site did deliver the quarter in aggregate. Um, yes. So there are some exceptions that we could argue, as Daniel's alluded to, but at the moment, 
we haven't achieved this target. Yes. Um, given the heat. Yes. yes. I, and we have absolutely seen the challenges others have, but we've been fortunate in the way we've been able to deal with it. So it's been an impressive achievement by the teams. What Dan can't see is the week to date for the NHS, Epsom St Helier is 95.57, and we're 17th best in the country. So, out of 150 odd. So, there you go. The stranded patients one, I think, is quite interesting. It ties to delayed transfers of care. I think, for me, stranded patients is a much better metric because it tells you what's actually going on. So you are defined as stranded if you've been in hospital for seven days or more for any reason, and 21 days makes you a super stranded. The first metric effectively measures your clinical and operational efficiency. How quickly do you make decisions? The second is much more about your integration with the local care system. And it's the latter measure we have a challenge from NHSE and NHSI to reduce as a system. And you can see on both charts we're reducing both the percentage and the overall numbers of <coughs> stranded and super-stranded patients. And we're very much seeing the benefits of that being delivered on a daily basis in terms of our bed availability and our ED flow. Dan, just it's a really small point, but um, this is obviously a new metric that's come in. I think it might be really helpful to have an asterisk and an explanation, because I think we, we've all come to understand the definitions, but I'm just yeah. thinking if you're looking at this uh, new, um, it might be difficult to glean what's actually meant by being stranded in a hospital. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then in terms of ambulance handovers, we have unfortunately not got the data for London because they have not given us access to their system because they're trying to validate it at the moment. Um, we've had a slight drop in our handovers for Epsom, but we remain amongst the best performers for CCAM, and we're not on their worry bead list at the moment. We also know that the rebuild of the A&E here, or sorry, the enlargement over the next few months will give us more space to offload ambulances and a rapid assessment area which should make further improvements. But we are above the same time where we were this time last year, so I think we're in a good place. I'll pause there. Thank you. Any further questions for Dan? In which case we'll move on to workforce. Well, because, because because Kevin is gone and uh, Peter is on holiday, are there any questions on workforce? I mean, perhaps I could just... Yes, Arun, can you do it from a pod perspective? I could certainly try and do it from a pod perspective. So I think, you know, I, I think if we alluded to the fact that we have very few, sorry, fewer vacancies than we've had ever. Um, and I, but, but I do think, you know, taking Martin's point earlier, we need to address the point of attrition because we're, we're peddling really fast, um, but, but we're also losing um, very quickly. So, so we do need to address that. Um, I think the one big takeaway for me, certainly from POD, was our grip on medical staffing. Um, and I think, um, you know, uh, we, it's fragile, but we have made huge strides um, compared to where we were um, last year, uh, we have a very good understanding of where the gaps are and action plans in terms of how we're going to address those gaps. So I felt very reassured in terms of our medical staffing. We also had feedback from um, Sandy um, regarding our junior doctor exceptions, which was at an all-time low. So um, I think you know there is some some real kind of progress um, and in, in terms of medical staffing. So I mean I think those were sort of the big highlights. Um, we spoke about, I, I think Lisa, we spoke about the um, staff engagement program that Lisa's gonna be um, leading, that was, that was good. Um, and yeah, we also touched upon the nursing um, action plan, um, which we're making uh, progress on. So I think those were sort of really the big highlights. Just one thing to highlight, um, Chairman, um, for the board is we've started to use video a lot more and it's proved really successful. So you'll see on there um, a fantastic um, a patient called Beatrice um, that we did a small video for for renal um, and that went down really well um, and was tweeted a lot. Um, but we are using this technique a lot more now with some of um, our patients who want to tell their stories. It's a great way of getting feedback, um, but it's also a fantastic way of telling the 
story to the rest of the staff. So we're building a library of those. Um, uh, so we, and we're doing all of that in house. So um, we're really pleased with that as a as a vehicle for communication. Okay, thank you. Just to reiterate on about the previous meeting, there was quite a lot of people came up to me afterwards. So I hope you know, the slides will go on the website. So um, just that that will happen. We'll make sure that happens, Chairman. No Next. problem. Thank you, Chairman. So the first indicator under 3.3 is the income and expenditure before the provider and sustainability funding. So if at the end of quarter one, the trust achieved the target and we were slightly ahead of our planned deficit uh, at, at £13.7 million. And as a result of that, we were able to access the financial performance element of the STF, which is the, uh, the PSF, which is the second indicator. Um, uh, however, as Daniel has alluded to, we, as, because we didn't hit the, meet the quarter one a &E target, we're £700,000, uh, we missed that target. The provider sustain sustainability funding relating to finance in the first quarter is £1.5 million. So in summary, from a financial performance perspective, for quarter one, we've met our target. One of the reasons we did that is the cost improvement plan, where we were just over one point, just under 1.1 million pounds ahead of plan. And you can see the target and the blue bars cons consistently in the first quarter, we've met that. But you can also see the, the dotted red line, the target uh, gets increases quarter by quarter until the planned target of £17 million. On the second slide around capital, so notwithstanding the conversations we've had earlier, the plan still remains £50.1 million, and in the end of quarter one, we'd spent uh, £5.8 uh, million, which was essentially on target for the first quarter. The red line you can see, the dotted target line you can see. And again, the target increases as the year draws wears on. Cash, uh, cash management, as, as you will appreciate, is a key focus for the finance team. And we uh, cash dipped in the in the month of June because of the planned uh, uh, provider the STF funding from last year was planned for in June, but didn't arrive till July. We have now received that. And again, a continued focus to ensure we pay our suppliers on time. Uh, and uh, you can see the metrics there are. Uh, well, the target is set up perfect, 100%, which I don't think any trust achieves, but certainly we do better than our, our peers in, 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 the, in southwest London, and we're at 94%, and we've maintained that throughout last year and continue to do that first quarter. I'll take questions if there are any. Any questions? Yes, um, two, two related questions, really, on the NHS pay increase. The government announced that yeah. Um, it would be funded, there would be extra money for it, which is a financial issue. The other one, which is partly financial, but obviously also comes into workforce and workforce morale, uh, th there seemed to be some suggestion that not everybody was getting quite the headline figure that perhaps they were expecting, be yeah. interested. Yeah, so, so the first part of the question, just as way of background, all staff were, uh, there was a 1% pay award and, and all trusts were properly funded for that. Then the government announced a further pay award, um, with, which there was a headline number, but the different, there was a differential on what grade staff were on what they actually received. Um, and um, to answer the second question first, I think the headline numbers that this, the government and the press were quoting, not all staff received that, so there's clearly uh, a morale issue there. So there was disappointment in many staff who thought they would receive a, a greater percentage than they actually received. Secondly, the um, HR will talk to it better, but secondly, the, the structure of the pay spine has also changed as a result of that, and that resulted in people not getting the, the pay award that they were in that they thought they would get. That's also obviously caused some issues, and it's caused some issues in my finance team as well. Um, 
but the, from a finance perspective, FD perspective, the additional funding for the new pay award ha hasn't been sufficient. So we, we estimate that f uh, depending on va variations, that there's between a three quarters and a million pound short, shortfall in the funding for this additional pay award. We've obviously flagged that up with NHS improvement. And I don't think we're an outlier. Other trusts are experiencing similar levels of, uh, income, of funding shortfall for the new pay award. Uh, when I spoke to the centre, they recognised that as an issue. So, so, for example, they calculated the uplift to each trust based on the number of people in post. But the number of people in post doesn't take account of your number of temporary staff. And you can't not pay your, at least your bank temporary staff, the pay rise that they would get if they, when they're a permanent member of staff. So that's one of the examples of how they didn't get it right. And equally, when you go and recruit more people and you fill posts, because they did it with people in post, anyone who you recruit after the time they did the calculation, also they didn't give you the money for. So there's been a, a, a lot of feedback back up the system, which says you have just actually given another big cost pressure to the NHS in the way you have done this. And I don't think they currently haven't got a response. No. To I, was it. I was going to ask whether we felt there was going to be any um, uh, response that might alleviate some of that pressure. No. <coughs> no. <coughs> Can I ask, I mean, the, the formulae for the increases, pay increases, was obviously very complicated. Yeah. Um, uh, this is perhaps one for, for um, HR, but uh, what assurance or how, do we, how can we be confident that we have properly applied the correct formulae across our workforce? Um, so <coughs> we, our, our payroll providers is outsourced and it's a, it's a pay, payroll provider that a number of NHS organizations use. So all of the CCGs use this pay, payroll provider. Um, We've, uh, I think the HR team, and I think I need to speak with them in detail, I've done some, some sort of um, spot checks, but we are reliant on the payroll provider um, having done the calculations correctly. To date, I, I'm not aware of anyone um, saying that they've been paid incorrectly, and if they have, it's because they were expecting more than they were, uh, they eventually got. So. Yeah. Um, but we do need to do that yeah. piece of okay. systematic so, due so, diligence. So, so, so there are only a very small number of payroll providers yeah. in the NHS. And there's a national, they all work on an, the electronic staff record, so there's a national yeah. way of doing this. And the government's just commissioned them to apply the rules that they gave, and we just get the recipient, yeah. the recipient of that. The, the issue that is so complicated, which has caused so much staff upset, is that essentially the headline was everyone gets a 3% pay rise. But the, they all, the government were clear when they announced this that they said people on the lower end of the pay scales would get a disproportionately large pay rise. Well, the consequence for that is people at the top end of the pay scales have not. Now, I, I, there's a, a lot of <clears throat> feedback, I think, to NHS employers and to the unions that they didn't communicate that very effectively to staff. But I don't think the government have been dishonourable in what they said, because what they have that they were clear about what it was they were trying to do, which was give a bigger pay rise to lower paid staff. So the 3% is actually an average. Average, yes. exactly. Yeah. So, so if you're at the top end of the top of the pay scales, your pay rise was about 1.8%. Just, just very quickly, the issue was not just this, the, the size of the, the percentage you got, depending on where you were. What people, I think, were not aware of was the change in the pay structure, the spine. And, and I think that that those two complications have have really um, people were not aware of those two things but put together. Presumably, this, uh, because this is a national thing, presumably the unions and various other uh, royal colleges, so they, they will be taking this up on behalf of all their members nationally. Well, they're in a difficult position. Royal College and Nursing actually have So I, I'm also. Essentially, I'm saying I'm not very happy with NHS employers. So they're the people who negotiate on our behalf. Because I don't think they explained it sufficiently to us as an employer to enable us to communicate effectively with our staff, too. So this is, this is a two-sided thing. They negotiated something really complicated. And then I don't think either sides have been able to explain it sufficiently clearly in advance of the thing happening. Um, so, and the, so Rakesh's point about the pay spines. So. 
under the previous agenda for change arrangements, there were a lot of incremental steps in each pay band, and in the new setup, they've reduced the number of increments. But the, so, in one level, it makes it easier for people to get up the increments. But if you happen to be squashed between where you thought you were about to get an increment and now you're not, that's why you haven't yes. got a pay rise. Um, that's been the main determinant, actually. Yeah. And, and sorry, just to go back to the dull old systems and controls point, is the payroll outsourcer actually responsible for the implementation, or are we placing reliance upon them based upon information that we are supplying based upon our HR records? Yeah, so as, as Daniel says, the payroll is paid from our um, ESR records, which we sort of maintain, and they use that as the input data, if you like, and then the responsibility is for them to apply the correct payroll percentage and spine points to those individuals. But the raw data comes from us. We we maintain, we and HR maintain the ESR system, the, the employer staff record system. But I know there was also some guidance issues. Uh, so the safeguarding report is, uh, um, is a report to the board that is uh, required as part of our, um, our statutory no. no. So it was. So we definitely didn't talk about CTM. Yeah. It was added. it not added? It's not on board, but. Oh. Yeah, mine is there as well. Mine is on the it, new admin. It must have come up since this admin morning. Admin control. Can we, um, are we allowed to defer it until next time we meet, or has it got a time? No, no, you can defer it. And then we will do that. It so has there's been a technical glitch. We're switching over between one electronic filing system and another, and we all still use the old one for this meeting, and going to go on the new one. In fact, we've got the people coming in to give some training after this, uh, but obviously something slipped through. Yeah. Okay, let's... You see, said we weren't doing right when they came. So this is the first outing of the new board assurance framework, which we have consulted with our internal auditors on about how do we describe this in the most appropriate way. So if you just skip through the executive summary and you just look at one of the priorities, you'll see that the way we're now doing the BAF, uh, this is one of the landscape pages on page three, is to take the priority, say these are the risks in the risk register that relate to that priority and what is the score. Then the middle part of the, lands the first bit of the landscape page looks like what we had last year, which is what are the indicators in the risk and what progress are we making against the RAG. And then there's a second page that relates to what are the risk controls in place and what are our sources of assurance. So we've then covered all the bases for each of the priorities that we need to to demonstrate we're managing our board assurance framework. So that's how it now is presented. And have we sent this to the CQC? 
Uh, no, I don't so think we sent it to the CQC. But well, she told I, them that we've done it. But they will see it, won't they? It, it, we, we can actually be very helpful to actually take it to our next relationship meeting with them on the 12th of exactly. September. We've told them we're doing it, but I think it would help, be helpful for them to see the evidence it's, and the right, end good. product. So exactly. will you do that? I'll do that on the 12th of September. Good. good. Thank you very much. And then you can see that in terms of how are we doing in quarter one, which is just to go to the exact summary of the thing, um, this is hard going. Mm -hmm. We've set ourselves some very challenging objectives, even though there are fewer of them. And you have to put it in the context of quarter one was pretty... Um, hard, hard work for operationally, because if you if you can cast back your m memory back to April, that that was extreme in emergency pressures. And I think one of our bits of learning that we reflected on with NHS improvement earlier in the week when we were having our regulatory meeting is we're really good at managing the emergency pressures in the here and now, but the way we do it is we all stop doing all the other things and all of us focus on managing care for patients safely in the here and now and that means it's quite hard to do lots of the other stuff mm -hmm. and that's why we're a bit behind on some things so we've got yeah. to we've got to work out how do we manage to deliver the operational pressures with less of all of us spending all our time doing it because we get more sustainable at it um, and that's quite a hard piece to enable us to then deliver more to give us the bandwidth to do more of the corporate priorities <coughs> Yes, I mean, I think it's very difficult, but clearly delivering the operational pressures in the here and now is what we're here for, basically. Well, that's, what, that's our number one priority, isn't it? Well, it's all a number one priority. Yeah, I know, but it's more of a number one well, priority than the other stuff. <laughs> if you see what I mean. <laughs> the trick is to make sure that we can manage the here and now without jeopardising the future. Exactly, the exactly. Because that becomes the here and now. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, and we do recognise... There's a little list there. They all seem to be buildings. Uh, and Trevor's not here, but... Uh, and, they fall, and they fall follow the, the procurement follow the process. Yeah. Yes, you can see that there are you know, lots of suppliers. Good. Anything else on the contracts? Good. In which case, we can go to any other business. Does anyone have any other business? Good. So, in that case, that's the end of the... Board meeting, the next board meeting is in October. We have a public briefing in September, and we've got a few minutes left, even though we're behind for questions. So, I'd like to ask anyone to the public. Thank can, you. I, can I just ask what's happening with the Bradbury Wing? Because, as you know, it's now devoid, it's not attached to the hospital. Bradbury Wing? Yeah, it's where the, when the Butterfly Centre is, where we see cancer patients. You now cannot get to the centre without going outside our building. So they're coming from, I happen to do the hematology clinic, they're coming from bloods at the front of the hospital, they're finding their way all the way through, all the new doors, and then they're out in the cold, and there is nowhere, no way of them getting into the Bradbury wing without going out into the cold. The pavements are not flat. I can only say if you would like to take a bariatric patient in a wheelchair and try and get it into the door, you will struggle because I did it last week and it was a con and I had for a horrible minute thought I wasn't actually even going to get her up the little bit of concrete that went over the footstep into a single door. It is electronic, but the only way to get to it is to come from the 
other end of the of the path. I, th I think it's a really good point. Um, I think we've made a lot of positive changes in our environment quite quickly, and clearly what we haven't done is walk every pathway through. No. So I think what we can I mean, do from here is to commit... OK. I, I don't think any of us around the table can actually probably adequately respond, but I think what we can very definitely say is we'll take this away and look at whether there is anything we can do to be able to access a Bradbury from inside the hospital, which I think is the exam yeah, question. How many of you have actually ever been up from the Bradbury? That's what I said. Yeah. Yeah, I know you have, because we've, we've, we've got those come up. We seem to be a bit devoid. Nobody ever seems to know where we are. Or we will look at that. We'll look you know. at that detail of the access. I don't like the idea of pumps, which you have to No, I mean, there, there are, the pavement goes down to the road for wheelchair access to the road, but you <coughs> try taking somebody who's about 17 to stand in the wheelchair over that, yeah. it's, it's actually not very easy. As you said, I'm Barry Gusses. I live in Epsom. So, um, when I've been listening, obviously you're under enormous financial pressures, right? and therefore your budget uh, per year that you've set actually must reflect trying to get savings, if that's the way it always is, in the HS. And then you have the public listening and uh, worried about the fact that you haven't got enough nurses, you haven't got enough doctors. Um, and then you look at your, the paperwork you've given out, and, and I just wonder, most organisations that I've worked in the health service, actually almost assume that they've got a 10 to a 15 percent uh, vacancy rate. So does your budget, if somebody said to you, look, I can provide you with 100 percent full posts of all your nurses and all your doctors, do you actually realistically have the budget for that? Or have you actually budgeted for a 10 percent or 15 percent vacancy? So um, in, in the 25 odd years I've worked in hospitals, budgets are never set for vacancies uh, and, and attrition. But however, for this year, we've, we've as a board, recognised that, you know, one has to be pragmatic. So for our medical staffing budget, for the first time this year, we looked at the vacancy rate last year and the spend on, on a premium rate locums in agency, and we've created a budget for that this year. Nursing staff typically always have an overhead for annual leave, sickness, and, and, and study leave, and we always build that in. Where we don't have that is for non-clinical staff. So if there are vacancies in non-clinical staff for whatever reason, or we have to use premium rate, then th that's a different issue. But for so the, reason, the reason I ask is I'm used to running, I ran a big department in Glasgow, and the, you know, if I had a vacancy, somebody retired, there was a lot of pressure to actually be, hold back that vacancy for three months to make that saving so I could balance my budget. And it's the easiest way to make savings is actually in salary savings by actually withholding posts for a few months. But could I just add, so one of the things I noticed, being still relatively new to the NHS, but worked for a lot of other organisations, is one of the differences in the NHS is the ratio of permanent cost to temporary staff costs is extremely high. So you obviously the, the, the exact closer to the details, but I would imagine that one of the reasons why it's not a problem is the amount that you would save on the temporary so, staffing is so high. Yeah. 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 So, so, so that was the point I was yeah. going to make. So if yeah. someone gifted us 300 clinicians and we had no vacancies, our expenditure would come down, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. right? Yeah. Because, because the bit that I think must, must have changed since you were managing in Glasgow yeah. is we've got minimum safe staffing levels everywhere. Okay. So you have to fill the posts. And if you haven't got permanent people, you're using temporary people. Now, and one of and one of more. and they cost and at least fifty percent more than if you had permanent people. Yeah. But one of the things that we're now working on, which is a, could be a really yeah. big cost pressure for the future, is Arlene has been asked to review all the minimum staff staffing levels in nursing across every clinical area. And if that comes back and says the minimum needs to be higher, okay. then actually that's a huge new cost that we have to uh, yeah. encounter. So questions. Um, I've heard it before, maybe, but why, why aren't the questions included in the in the meeting and uh, the answers recorded? Well, officially, because the board meeting ends at the end of the meeting, and this is a Q and A session, which isn't part of the formal book. That's okay, but some of the things are 
worth listening to. Aren't oh, they? Uh, Bob, I, I absolutely and, and always feel that this part of the meeting is the best part. Hmm? Always do that? <laughs> <laughs> I do, I do because that's I, think, I think it's really important that we, we get the views of people who don't work here every day. And they, you know, so I, let me reassure you that every single thing that comes through, so for example, your point on Bradbury, we will take it away and deal with it. Okay. I still think uh, the people that put the question in, and, and other people, they, they'd like to see what the answers are, what, and what the questions are, too. Yeah? No, um, just, Chairman, we are still recording now, and this recording is put on the website, so... So the information, so if people want to go online and watch and listen, <laughs> we're there. Would you do it? <clears throat> Absolutely. No, no, you wouldn't. Uh, anyway, okay, number one. Okay, I've done number one. Number two. Um, from the minutes of the meeting on the 15th of June, 15 set challenge. The points that are in down here. They're mumbo jumbo, right? There's, there's no action. There's no. What are you going to take away from these comments and make use of? And this wasn't what I was going to ask before I came to the meeting. I was going to say, and um, it would be a great idea, maybe, when you have your 15 steps, to have three, three points per team, and you just have. One sentence, because it seems like, and I'm not talking about today, but it seems like, um, is it question time taken up? Right? It's, there's a lot of chat, and it should be that one could have several bullet points finished. Three, four bullet points per um, group that go to a particular place. I think, I think on your point about the 15 steps, Bob. <coughs> is that... The way it's been written, um, there will have been specific things to talk about and would have been dealt with. Certainly whenever uh, we do 15 sets, we come up with a very specific issue like, you know, I don't know what's going on here. Okay. I didn't go to this meeting, you see, no. so I'm, uh, I'm looking for this and I'm saying, I can't make any sense of this. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I take your point. Do rest assured that we do take every specific recommendation from a 15 set to this issue mm -hmm. and act on Right, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I, I wonder if you could um, let me know exactly what the situation is regarding the maternity units at Pellier Hospital. We have a certain MP going around saying everybody in Lower Morton that it's closing. Um, I did send the copy of a PDF of the thing to this lady and to me. Um, and, and it is rather confusing to uh, just a, a resident in Lower Morden. Very open to me. In fact, we even opened a new room in it this week, um, where, where some uh, a couple of parents had raised twenty thousand pounds to have it refurbished uh, for, pe for, for for bereavements, but. Okay, we better challenge that. I hadn't realised she said that. I thought I thought I had read it as it's the normal. Um, <coughs> in the future, there may not be St Helier's in the acute hospital because it may, might have moved to Epsom or <coughs> Sutton uh, conversation. But she actually said maternity is closed, is she, or closing? Is it possible for some sort of communication with the residents of Because we don't get the Guardian yeah. newspaper universally. Through, through so, well, only if there's a residence target. association that we can write and to. This seems to be the target of this <coughs> Do you have a residence association? She saves St. Paddy's Hospital. Rubbish. So Politicians so. can't close them, can't open them. Only <laughs> you folks can. And it's the excellent job you're doing. Well, we'll see how we can get to the residence <coughs> association that you. Is there a residence association in Lower Morden? There are a number of residence associations. Yes, yeah. yes there is. Well, I think the thing to do would be just to. First of all, we'll, we'll, we'll see what has been said and then we'll make sure that we get right. the correct if you message out. Thank um, you for that. And if I could ask as well, um, this, this GP has been known to make immediate appointments. This sounds superb. Does it affect or, or does it include 
Yes. 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 Good, lovely. And the last one is staff turnover ratio. Have 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 you got a staff turnover ratio and what it is annually? The indicator is. So if the patient is unfit, they don't count in the indicator. Right, These are right. the, the indicator is all about things that we get wrong as to why we can't operate on the patient. Thank you, because I, I don't think it was quite clear. clear. From So yes, you're absolutely right, we moved the bin. We are looking at where we put the posters in A&E, purely because we're looking at how um, patients come in and out, and you've already heard somebody describe quite um, articulately how um, um, things can get in the way of patient flow. So we are on it, and next time you and I meet, it will be resolved. Okay, well, I've got a suggestion. I, I don't know whether it works or not, but there are two chairs, is it two chairs between yes. the, two, the two doors? If they were not there, it could sit between the two doors. Or it could go on one of the doors. Thank you, Bob. Let's have a look at that, though, for you, Bob. Thank you for that. No, it's all right. That's right. right. Here, no, no, that's great. Good. Well, thank you all very much for coming, and particularly to all of you who've sat through everything. And uh, we will see you next time.